بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا ونبينا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين ناسيا بقية الله في الأرضين أجل الله تعالى فرجة الشريف اللهم أخرجني من ظلمات الوعد وأكرمني من نور الحق اللهم افتح علينا أبواب رحمتك وانشر علينا فزاء ونعلمك برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين We've been discussing Islamic theory of ethics and alhamdulillah so far we have addressed different aspects of this theory and the last point was about who should be the beneficiary because we said that for us it's important that the action leads to good outcomes then we said a question arises good outcomes for whom here you know we have egoist altruist universalist and as you remember, I said that many people think that Islamic theory is that the action should have a good outcome for the agent. So it's a kind of uh, ethical egoism, which is different from selfishness. But then I explained that it seems that although it is quite acceptable that we have interest for our own good, we have self-love, we, we do many, many things for uh, our own progress, for our own you know, good, and this is different from selfishness, but we said that there is possibility of arguing that in human beings there are also genuine desires for good of others, so we can be egoist and at the same, the same time altruist and also we said we can go even further we may do things that are not necessarily beneficial for either us or someone else we do things for the sake of them being good things in themselves like doing something for the sake of knowledge doing something for the sake of beauty doing something for the sake of truth even not thinking whether I am benefiting or someone else is benefiting. This is my duty towards truth, towards uh, goodness or towards beauty. So we discussed this issue. Now what I want to discuss today is what is a good outcome? You remember we were talking about the point that an action is good when it leads to a good outcome, good result. And then we said this is not circular. The first good is moral goodness, the second is defined outside morality. An action is morally good if it leads to good outcomes and these good outcomes are to be defined outside ethics. You define them philosophically or religiously or you know ideologically but it's outside realm of morality so what is a good outcome is the question there are different views among ethicists about what is good outcome I hope you remember everything that we have discussed so far. You know, you remember that we said there are theological views, there are, you know, deontological views, there are virtue ethics. This is about those who have teleological view. So for them, good outcome is important or avoiding bad outcome. Among these people, they have different understanding of what is good outcome. For example, for some people, the good outcome is pleasure. Lazza. There are people who are hedonists, or you know, in Arabic, they are called the people who hold asalatul lazza. Means that we do something in order to enjoy ourselves. 
or in order to avoid pain. It's either pleasure or pain. Either you want to gain pleasure or you want to avoid pain. But then, among the people who have this idea, some of them have a more sophisticated understanding of pleasure. Some are very uh, simple. They mean by fle the pleasure, physical pleasure. The pleasure that you gain by eating a delicious food or drinking you know, a nice you know, drink, or for example, having comfortable bed, or you know, sexual desire. For some people, pleasure is just this. Some people say no. We have to also consider long-term pleasure. The pleasure that someone gains by learning, by doing good to other people. The pleasure of Akhirah. So some people add different types of pleasure. And therefore, this can become a theory which is uh, reliable, uh, at least to some extent, or maybe completely depending on uh, what is your own theory of ethics. For example, we have uh, some of our greatest scholars uh, who believe that indeed happiness or sa'ada, felicity, is a matter of ladda, is a matter of pleasure. But the pleasure which is caused by understanding, the pleasure is caused by nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But it's a matter of pleasure. Uh, two, three years ago, uh, I was uh, supervising a PhD uh, thesis in Qom about the role of pleasure or ladda in uh, Aristotelian and also Mullah Sadra's theory of ethics. And there are lots of, you know, uh, references in, you know, even someone like Mullah Sadra to the role of ladda in ethics, but not ladda of eating and drinking. A very, uh, you know, sophisticated, a very, you know, high level of ladda, ladda of, for example, a mystic when he has monajat with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is also ladda. So, some people have ladda, but in different forms. Some people say the good outcome is welfare. Everything that leads to welfare, it's good. We have to do things in order to improve condition of life of people. But when they say conditions, they mean, for example, people should be able to find, you know, job. People should find accommodation, you know, food, you know health, these type of things. So for them, everything has to be defined within the boundaries of welfare. Some people say self-realization. This is also an interesting idea. Every human being has potentials. And when you do things that help you to flourish yourself, to develop yourself, to actualize your potentials, that is good. So self-realization is something that they consider. Some people say nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everything that leads to nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is good. Orb. Nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there are different ways, but uh, maybe after some reflection, some you know, careful consideration, we can find these things somehow related to each other. For example, self-realization, if it is done properly, certainly comes with nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, 
in uh, Islamic mysticism, we have a term, insane kamil. I'm sure you have heard this term, insane kamil. The perfect man, or some people translate the most perfect man, but uh, I think the perfect man is enough. So, this term is a term which is very important. In English, actually, it's very difficult to use this perfect. Because when you say perfect means has to have no deficiency, no limitation. When you say some, if you say someone is perfect. And it seems that in this sense, only Allah is perfect. No one can be perfect. Yeah? And this is why I say, you know, to say most perfect, that is too much. Because even we have problem with saying perfect, man. So the most perfect is... So, uh, there's a kind of uh, linguistic problem here. But I think the idea is not that we have a perfect man, which is problematic. It's, you know, like a paradox. How can a human being be perfect, yeah? I think when they say insan kamil, they mean someone who is complete in humanity. Okay, not that he is a being and this being is perfect. No, no, it means that in humanity, this person has developed and has become a complete human being. Because we have so many potentials that unfortunately 99% of people never actualize those potentials. Yeah? When it comes to even ordinary skills, for example, you know, about our writing, handwriting. Some people, you know, become very uh, skillful. They have very good handwriting. Many people know. But I don't think there is any problem in the DNA or genes of the people who don't have good handwriting. Yeah? They, I think everyone can become. Or, you know, painting. Sometimes, you see, we cannot, you know, maybe work with the, you know, colors and with the paints and with the pens and this type of thing. But we see there are people who are disabled and with their toes, they paint. There's a lady uh, that she paints with her toes. So is she different creation? No. She has used a potential that Allah has put in all of us. We haven't used because we were not in need of that. Yeah? Uh, you know, the people, for example, who are blind, they have very good, you know, sense of hearing or, you know, smelling, many things that they can understand and we cannot understand. Yeah, because we have not used our skills and talents and potential. So, this is about normal skills, but also there are many other things that only those who are close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have developed. Yeah? There are experiences that we have never had. Yeah? If you ask a child, what is the, your greatest pleasure? A child who is, you know, three years old. What is his greatest pleasure? His greatest pleasure is to have ice cream or I don't know some chocolate and also see that his, his parents are around because if he's lost and he has this he, there's no joy the parents are around so he feels secure and then it's his ice cream that's the greatest joy for a child yeah the parents must be there but how can a child understand the pleasure of a mother looking at her child, when child is happy, smiling, or the father looking at child and seeing child is happy, smiling, successful, the, the child cannot understand this. Or the experience of someone who has been helping poor people. 
how much pleasure you gain when you can solve someone's problem. Or when you are a good teacher and you can you know, see that now your students have learned. Yeah, it's the pleasure that is great. So, there are experiences that some people have not had because they haven't reached that level of age or, I don't know, maturity or experience. And there are many experiences that none of us has had. We cannot understand what was Rasulullah's experience when he was in the cave of hell. He must have enjoyed so much that, you know, he stayed there for days and nights. Yeah, for us, maybe if we go to a cave for a few hours, is enjoyable. Maximum one night. But, you know, to be there for a few weeks, it's... I don't think we understand that pleasure. What was the pleasure of Amir al Mu'mineen when he was standing for prayer? Yeah? I don't think it's because we cannot achieve that. There is such potential in us, but unfortunately we haven't actualized this. So you see that we have also ulama who have very beautiful experiences, but we, have, we don't have. So, we have lots of potentials in human beings. And Insan Kamil is the one who has become complete or Kamil in his humanity. Not that he has become Kamil in the sense that he is perfect, full stop. Only Allah is perfect, full stop. Okay? But also, there is a second point. Can anyone be complete in his humanity? Again, here I think we have to be careful. Because Allah has put infinite capacity in us. No matter how much someone has progressed, still there is more in front of him. Yeah? So no, we cannot say anyone has reached the point that all potentials have been actualized. He cannot get better. So... We should have then a line. This is my understanding. There must be a line. When someone reaches this line, then we can say from this line above is Ensana Kamil. Although he's still going ahead, but this is the line. You know, like, uh, for example, uh, someone who is known Recognized as a mujtahid. We say, okay, to reach ijtahad is a line. Below that, you are not mujtahid. When you reach the level that you can understand Islamic rulings from the text, from the Quran, from Sunnah, you, you know how to interpret, how to verify. When you reach this line, you are mujtahid. But Mujtahids themselves have different levels. Mujtahids can improve. Someone who has become Mujtahid today compared to someone who has become Mujtahid 10 years ago, maybe there is progress. I'm not saying necessarily. You cannot say necessarily age makes a person more knowledgeable, but it can help. Or it's likely to help. Uh, or the more he studies, the more he teaches, the more he discusses. So his ijtihad can become a stronger. Yeah? Like a person who has license for driving or a person who has license for medical, you know, for example, sciences. So the first day after graduation and, you know, after 10 years of practice are not the same. But even the first day after graduation, he is on that line. Okay? So, insan Kamil is not the one who is perfect, and also is not the one who has reached the end of progress for humanity. Rather, insan Kamil is the one who has been able to 
reach that stage that inshallah I will try to explain what is that stage and go beyond so he has passed that turning point okay he has gone you know high what is that line that if you are lower you are not still complete in humanity and when you are above you are complete in humanity that is very important question we need to uh, think about this a lot and this needs lots of discussion and uh, I think unfortunately it's not uh, that much discussed in this way maybe from different you know attitudes uh, or angles they have looked at this but this from this angle it needs I think more discussion maybe we can say that Insane Kamil or a person complete is in his humanity is the one that has achieved major qualities of human beings. Those qualities which define humanity. If you remember in one of our early sessions, we had a discussion about what is human. You remember? Maybe it was in the other hall that I explained that we have characteristics that we share with animals or even we share sometimes with animals and plants. Sometimes we share with animals and plants and non-living beings. And we have characteristics which are exclusive to humanity. And we said, these are the main characteristics. These are the characteristics that make us human being. And we said there is a rule in philosophy. They say, The reality of something is made by its very last differentia. Remember, we had this discussion. So, if those characteristics which are only available in human beings are actualized if they start functioning then that person is above the bottom line for example when it comes to being a thinking person a thinking being or a rational being or a person who follows knowledge is knowledge based a person who is seeking truth a person who is kind and helpful a person who is generous a person who is brave a person who is modest okay these are the things which are important virtues for human beings if someone has these values and virtues then he is above the bottom line although in each of these or some of them he can still grow but he is not a person who is without those virtues he is not a person who is not generous but his generosity can improve he is not a person who is you know not brave but his bravery can improve so if you have those characteristics, those virtues that are only available in human beings or we expect from human beings to have them and you don't have the vices which are opposite to them because if they have, you have them then you don't have the vices the razail then you have reached the level of completion in humanity not perfection, completion in humanity so this is very beautiful that in Islam we don't have negative view of humanity. We don't have negative view of human beings because in some traditions and some religions humanity is looked, you know, upon in a very, you know, looked down, you know, in a very negative way. They don't 
consider human beings good especially they say after the you know fall after the sin which was committed by adam humanity went to a very big problem our nature is distorted we have lots of now problems in our you know way of creation you know like for example sometimes you have a car okay which needs repair but sometimes a car is made by factory in the way which is faulty you cannot repair it there's something in the fabric of the car which is wrong then the you know the company says you know bring back this car we don't you know want you to suffer and we don't want to lose our reputation so just bring back the car so for some people human beings are those cars which are produced faulty and they have to be taken back <laughs> by God but we don't have this understanding we say human beings are created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the best way if there is any problem it's in some human beings okay like some cars are broken down but it's not a problem with the you know design of the car the production of the car so in islam we have very positive view about human beings allah says نَفَخْتُ فِيهِ مِنْ رُوحِي I have blown Of course, you know, Allah said this before creation of Adam فَإِذَا سَوَّيْتُهُ وَنَفَخْتُ فِيهِ مِنْ رُوحِي فَقَعُوا لَهُ سَاجِدٍ When I create Adam and complete his creation and then blow into him from my spirit then you should do sajda Okay? Don't do sajda before soul is given to Adam. So it means that our body, which is very nice, you know, medicine for thousands of years has not yet understood everything about our body, but the angels were not asked to do sajda for our body. Yeah? It was when soul was given to body, when body had life, then they had to do sajda. Okay? So, human beings are so valuable that Allah says, this is my soul, my spirit, that I am blowing into them. Of course, you know that Allah doesn't have any spirit, Allah doesn't have any body, any part, any partner, nothing can be separated from God. Even in our mind, we cannot say, okay, this part of God or that part of God, okay? But... To honor human spirit, he says what? He says, this is my spirit. This is to honor. In Arabic, we call it al-idhafatu tashrifiyya. Tashrif means to honor. Okay, inshallah, in ilm al you learn this. Al-idhafatu tashrifiyya. Sometimes we say something is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just to honor. Like for example, Yawmullah. We have day of God and days of God. Ayyamullah. House of God. Yeah? And here we have a spirit of God. This is to honor the spirit. And Allah here has honored this spirit, I think, at least by three things. One is, he says, Ruhi. One. Second, by saying, Nafahtu. I blow this. It's very important, something which comes from God. Of course, God doesn't have a mouth to blow, but this is the way that we can understand. So God is attributing to himself. He doesn't say when he is created, when he has my soul. When, uh, for example, an angel gives my soul. Nafahtu. Even, you know, when Allah speaks to Iblis, why he didn't do sajda, he said, what caused you not to do sajda? 
for what I have created with my hands. Okay? I have created Adam with both my hands. You know how much Allah is bringing himself into this. Okay? It shows that Allah's will, Allah's love, Allah's, you know, intention was to do this definitely. Very closely he was involved. So, Ruhi, one point. Nafakhto, the second point. And then do sajda. All the angels have to do sajda. This is the third point. So at least in three ways, Allah is showing the importance of Adam. Okay? So we have very positive view about humanity. So you don't need to sacrifice your humanity in order to get closer to Allah. You know, maybe for you these things look very simple, but these are the things that, you know, great philosophers uh, in the West have not been able to understand. You know, there are people who think that the only way to improve our humanity is to forget God. They see conflict, but we don't see any conflict. We say that you don't need to sacrifice humanity for the sake of God or sacrifice God for the sake of humanity. We are created by God in the best form and our highest achievement is to be his vicegerent on the earth. So anything that can help you in being a complete human being is taking you further towards God. And those who want to improve humanity by detaching humanity from God, they are not serving humanity. You know, they are depriving humanity from the source of honor and from what is making you special. You know, it's like, for example, You have a radio. This is the example that uh, I think is uh, helpful. Please listen to this example very carefully. I had a discussion actually in the last trip to Italy uh, with you know some of our Christian friends, and uh, they were also you know, happy with this example. So we had the same understanding. You know, we were talking about those people who look at humanity without God and you know spirituality without God. I said, those people who only look at human beings in a secular way, they are only thinking about a radio which is switched off. A radio which is switched off is great. You know, you can be a scientist and studied this for years and years, how this was designed, how was this built, all these things which are inside this radio. It can occupy your life or end of your life. But then someone says, look, still you know very little about this. Let me turn it on. <laughs> then say, oh, I was totally wrong. I was studying this radio while it was disconnected. I want to study it now while it is connected. Before that, what could you do with this radio? Either it was just a trouble, or the maximum, if it was very beautiful, very nice, and not occupying too much space, just to put it on a, you know, I don't know, shelf or somewhere, you know, just to look at it. Look at it as a statue. But now when this right radio is turned on and tuned to a good station, not to a bad station, to a good <laughs> station that it can totally change your life experience. 
It wakes you up for your salat, you know, it can give you azan, it can give you lectures, it can give you guidance, it can do lots of good things for you. So, what is the difference between people who look at humanity just as a physical object, something to study in your know, departments of physics and chemistry and biology and medicine, and someone who looks at humanity without forgetting those things, but he says there is something greater. Humanity has the potential of being connected to God. And when humanity is connected to God, what comes down? Torah, Injil, Quran, they come down. So there's a big difference. So, we have to know that in Islam, we are not, you know, forced to choose between humanity and God, between humanity and religion, or between reason and revelation. Alhamdulillah, in Islam, everything comes at, at peace, in harmony. Yeah? Islam puts you in complete peace. Many of tensions and conflicts and contradictions disappear if we choose the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looks at the world you see no conflict everything is really together you know if you don't know how to use your fingers then they can start fighting and you cannot do anything with them but Alhamdulillah, from childhood, we learn how to use these fingers. Yeah? If you don't know how to use your eyes, imagine if someone is trained from childhood to look, you know, differently, and the, child, the, the eyes are never, you know, learned how to adjust themselves, you only could see two th things. I mean, not one picture. But we have learned how to use our eyes in a harmonious way. Yeah? Reason and revelation are like two eyes, two hands. There is no conflict. Humanity and God are not in conflict. The value of humanity is to be connected to God. And Allah's greatest blessing, greatest wisdom is understood by his creation of humanity and guidance of humanity. Yeah? So if you say something bad to humanity, you are not serving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's like, you know, someone has made, say, 10 pieces of art. And the one which is the best one, you say, this is rubbish. Then this is an insult. Anyone who says to human beings that you are rubbish, He's insulting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If someone says, I don't see value in human beings, he's insulting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If someone is a murderer, he's insulting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because Allah says, this is my best creation, and then you are killing people who are innocent. This is declaring war against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some people kill humanity physically, some people kill human beings theologically. In their theology, they kill human beings. They say, if you are human beings, you have no value. Even those people who say, unless a person is a Muslim, has no value, they are also insulting. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has honored all human beings. لَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي Adam. Amir al said to Malik, you have to be kind to all human beings because Emma Akun Laka Fiddin Aw Nadirun Laka Fil Khalq. Every human being has, has value. You know this verse in the Quran which is also similar to what is in the Bible. And Allah says, Men ajlazalik. Uh, because of this, you know, after the story of you know Habil and Qabil, you know, Allah says that we have you know put this. Uh, also for Bani Israel, that man qatala nafsan bi ghayra nafsan aw fasadin fil aad fa ka'annama qatala nasa jami'a. 
Also, man ahya nafsan, fakannamu ahya nasa jamia. This is not about Muslims. This is not about Christians, about Jews. This is about human being. Killing a human being is like killing all humanity. And it's declaring war against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because this is Allah's creation. And saving one human being is like sa saving all humanity. Of course, those who in addition to humanity have other qualities, their value increases. If someone is a human being and at the same time, for example, is a good person, is a person who serves other people, is a knowledgeable person, is a mu'min, is an arif, value can increase. But humanity is the ground, is the foundation. Yes, if someone is doing mischief, sometimes he's a murderer, someone is a mischief maker, then despite the valuable humanity in that person, maybe he is going to be punished. But that is different. That doesn't mean that humanity has no value. So, every person who grows his humanity, and we mean by humanity, those virtues, qualities which are potential in human beings and are characteristics of human beings, are exclusive to human beings. You cannot find them in animals, you cannot find them in plants, you cannot find them in stone and wood. If someone grows them and achieves them and get rid of the opposite vices, then he has reached the level that we can call him, he is complete in humanity. You know, in Farsi, we have this expression, Adam Shodan, Adamiyat. Maybe in Urdu also, they say Adamiyat, you know. So, Adam Shodan, there is a biological sense of Adam Shodan. That is, you know, every human child is Adam. But when... Uh, in literature, they use, you know, Adamiyat. Uh, it's different. It means that you have achieved qualities that are only available in human beings. And before this is Heywaniyat. It's Sabu'iyat. You are a wild animal. You are just someone who eats and drinks and attacks. So this meaning of Adamiyat is the same thing that I am explaining. A person who has grown in humanity, a person who has actualized his potentials. Okay? Of course, this person can go further and further. Now, let us look at the concept of nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and see how these two match. Are these two different things or they are related to each other? We can say that these are related to each other. When you grow in these qualities, you get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because these are the qualities that are loved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And most of them also are available in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I am saying most of them because maybe there are few qualities that for us, they are a matter of perfection, but for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they don't apply. Like, for example, humbleness. Humbleness is opposite to arrogance. We have to be humble. Okay? We cannot, otherwise we are arrogant. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has kibriya. He doesn't have istikbar. He has kibriya. What does it mean? We are not great. If we pretend to be great, this is a stick bar. But Allah is great. And he doesn't need to pretend that he is not great. Someone, you see, so Allah doesn't need to say, you know, that I am worse than you as a matter of humbleness. Say, oh, mashallah, we have very humble God. You know, he says, I am worse than you. <laughs> or, you know, he says, I also commit sins like you. No, we don't need to think of Allah in that way. 
humbleness is a virtue for us and to act or to pretend to behave to appear as someone who has no weakness no problem as someone who is perfect someone is great this is a step part because this is false okay but for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he is great and he should act as a great person okay so this is kibriya not istikbar and you know no one can think of having kibriya other than allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if a person start thinking just start thinking that he has any little you know any slight portion of kibriya he goes down there is no way for us to think we have kibriya look at what happened to pharaoh pharaoh thought that he is very important he said i am your greatest lord ana rabbukumul a'la i am your not i am just your lord i am your greatest lord yeah or at one stage he even went further because if you go this way of you know istikbar then very fast you go to the end yeah so you start first with telling your you know wife or husband or children or friends i am greater than you then you gradually you say i'm greater than prophet then i'm greater than god many people think like this because when you tell them this is the ruling of allah they say i know better allah in many people you know yes. maybe they don't say it verbally some of them say but some they don't say it verbally but you know they don't listen so when they, they don't listen to sharia it means that i know better Anyway, Pharaoh even reached the point he said, "Ma alim to lakum min ilahin ghayr." He said, "I don't know of any god for you other than myself." Ma alim to lakum min ilahin ghayr. Okay, even you know he wanted to say uh, this is to best of my knowledge. Ma alim to lakum means <laughs> he wanted to say that you know this is a expert view. Ma'alim to lakum min ilahin. It means that I have looked everywhere. I have done lots of research. And the best option. Yeah, and this is the only thing that I have found that I am your only God, so I have to take care of you. But <laughs> as a headache, as if you know he's doing a favor to them. You have no one else other than me to look after you. Whom you want you. So this is kebriya. It takes you. to the lowest level so there are qualities that between us and allah may be different because of we being creature and allah being creator but these are very few most of the qualities like wisdom like knowledge like i don't know mercifulness like you know forgiving uh, many qualities that we have in the quran about allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they can apply to us as well uh, we have a paper image of god in the quran uh, in first volume of islamic reference series so there is a list of all the qualities mentioned for allah in the quran about his mercifulness about his knowledge about his power and so on and so forth wisdom justice everything these qualities we can also have this is why we have this saying takhallaqu bi akhlaq allah try to acquire the traits character of allah as i said there is a little exception and that is like kibriya that's another issue but akhlaq allah is like what I listed. So, if you have these qualities that are human qualities, you have at the same time acquired akhlaqullah. So you have gone very close to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Do you see? 
how beautifully Allah has made us like himself. That when we grow in humanity, we at the same time get closer to him. Okay? It's not good to say Allah is a superhuman being. This is, you know, Allah is not a superhuman being. Or we cannot say that we are little God. Both of them are incorrect. But there is so much connection between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that when we grow, we become like him. The only thing that remains always is that we are created by him. Okay, this difference remains. You know, we have this saying from Ahlul Bayt. Nazzaluna an al-rububiyyah wa qulu fina ma sha'tu. You can give us different, you know, descriptions, you know, good qualities, but Nazzaluna an al-rububiyyah. Never think that we are lords. Because there were, you know, some zealots who were exaggerating. You cannot exaggerate and saying that prophet or imam or Jesus, you know, they had some kind of deity or lordship. No. They are servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But if you are talking about generosity, about mercifulness, about wisdom, okay, about these qualities, they have these qualities. But they have it from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Therefore, a very maybe good example here or analogy here is the example of Mirror and sun. Allah is sun. And these human beings who are close to Allah reflect the light which is coming from Allah. They don't have anything from themselves. But their beauty, their strength is in what? is that they can reflect light of Allah better than any other thing. Anything created by Allah in this world can reflect the light of Allah. Because anything created in this world has light. Allah alladhi khalaqa samawati wal ard wa ja'ala dhulumati wal nur. Everything has light. And darkness means weaker light. We don't have absolute darkness. Allah doesn't create anything which is absolutely dark. So, even a stone has light. Water has light. Everything has light, okay? But what is this light? Their light? No. The light is from Allah. The one that Allah doesn't give him light has no light. They are mirrors. And this is the meaning of sign. These are signs. These are ayah. Means they reflect the light of Allah. Okay? But how much a piece of wood can reflect? A piece of wood can reflect that much that till end of your life you cannot grasp. Even a piece of wood. If someone says that I have understood everything about a piece of wood, he is ignorant. Because even a very, very a small radiation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is enough to make you busy till end of your life. This is azamat of Allah that we have in dua kumail. This azamat of Allah, this greatness of Allah is in everything. So even a small piece of wood is enough to keep you busy. But what about a bird? A bird is much better mirror. What a bird can reflect from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not comparable to peace of God. Then, if there is a human being, a human being that Allah, when refers to the creation of a human being, he says, Then 
There was no one to say to Allah, Masha Allah. So he himself says, Fatabarakallah, Ahsan al Khaliq. Because some of the things has to be said. Okay? If you don't say, then you are not doing justice. So Allah has to say this. Fatabarakallah, Ahsan al Khaliq. This is for a human being. Okay? But even this is a human being, just a, st a stage of birth. Fatabarakallah, Ahsan al Khaliq. Now, if this person becomes Musa, Isa, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, then you can imagine how much these personalities can reflect. Okay. And still, they are mirror. That means they don't have anything from themselves. This is why they don't become arrogant. They know that they have nothing of themselves. They have tried just to remove anything that makes them unclear, anything, any dirt, anything, you know. They polish themselves so that they can only speak what God wants. They can only act what God wants. They can only tell people what God wants. So this is maximum you can get in the world of creation. The difference between Allah and them is completely there. No one should, na'uzu billah, think that they have any kind of deity, any kind of lordship. But anything that you want as a good quality is there. But in a created form. As a reflection. It's a reflection. So there is a very close relation between being complete in humanity and being close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inshallah, next session we will expand more on the concept of nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enable us to follow this path of development in our humanity and inshallah getting closer to Him. Muhammad wa Muhammad. Oh.